Hello, internet. Hello there, people, everybody, everywhere, doing good everything. Good evening, good evening. How is everyone doing? It is Tuesday night. Tuesday at the Scubas. Yep. Tuesday night over here at Scuba Studio with Scuba and the Rye, episode 72 for the week of November 16th. How is everyone doing? How are you doing, Rye? I'm good. Just tired. And yeah, I'll talk about more in the happenings of what's up. Yep. Yes, we'll get there. A couple of things to kind of go through real quick. Um, the podcast episodes are being are out. Uh, you can check them out on a lot of the major podcast channels. I signed up with three more distributions this week. Uh, should be able to start seeing it on iHeartRadio and Pandora and <laughs> a lot of other bunch places. other places as they keep adding things. Podbean has actually done some interesting upgrades to their account stuff. Um, they actually now allow you, you. There's actually a small. It used to be if you want to do multiple channel, multiple podcasts under one account, you had to set up different accounts or pay for the full subscription for each uh, podcast channel you want. Now they've decided to bring that all in it's just a small fee to add different channels but did uh upgrade it up so you might see you might hear some ads on the uh, in the audio versions that's just because you know got to the point we can nearly monetize we're almost up to a thousand downloads of the podcasts awesome sauce that is great news that is it's good law it's a law it's been a long road but we're getting there um want to give a shout out to sirenscape for the background musics and soundboards first we were listening to stream beats and now we will move over to sirenscape boom boom ba -doom, boom boom all righty so check out sirenscape.com for all the various sound sets they use for their tabletop experiences uh, I want to do a thank you to the community you got uh without you guys' support and uh viewership uh we couldn't we wouldn't be able to keep doing this stuff so all of that support is always helpful and all it takes is something as little as liking and uh posting a review uh on all our stuff uh following us like subscribe if it's on the youtube like and give her give a rating on the uh, podcast channels all that stuff is great it keeps the lights on it keeps us doing what we're doing uh, I'll a real quick rundown on our schedule. Tuesday nights, of course, is we are here for Scuba and Arai. Uh Saturdays, we do two D&D &D games. First at 10 a.m. Eastern is Shadow Watch. Group of adventurers uh, doing uh, eighth level adventurers uh, doing a couple of uh, updated modules from second edition AD&D &D into fifth edition. Uh, at, at 8 p.m. Saturday night is Challenge Accepted. Where it's a group, it's a group uh, uh, working on an objective uh, base for each season. Uh, currently working through Hour of the Knife uh, for them, and then Sundays is Sunday with Scoob, where it's just kind of a hangout, chit chat, do some planning, play some games, just kind of a morning show dealio. So that's uh, what we do here on Twitch. Uh, if you're checking us out via the other ones, and you want to check us out on live and uh, pose questions. Uh, just put you, just come on over to twitch.tv slash scuba studio for the and post your question. Do question in all caps or comment in all caps and it should aggregate up into a into a feed that we can read off and answer those questions. And with that, are we ready to get into this? Oh yes, ready and waiting. Oh yes. So alrighty. So first off is uh what's up, what we've been up to and what we've been doing. Rye, what you been up to this last week, my friend? <laughs> a lots and lots of writing, studying, all the good stuff that involves grad school. Oh, yeah. So I had, I know a lot of people, uh, I've been mentioning paper and my annotated bibliography. I wrote over the weekend and got it done. Edited, well, I wrote it and then I edited it today and put it up on the, on the Google Drive for the professor to read at some point. Plus oh, all good. the all the other assignments I had to do for class, so that's pretty much my whole weekend. Plus playing a certain game. Talk about that later. Mm -hmm. Um, and also I found you know some time to finish up a a new series on Netflix. Talk about that later. And also catch up on a few chapters on um the Robin Williams bio uh, biography book that I've been reading. So that's pretty much all I've been catching up with. Um, some car troubles. 
I'll leave that off the air. Uh, but <laughs> other than that, I'm looking forward to next week is Thanksgiving. I'm off the whole week. So I get to chill and relax. Probably still have some schoolwork to do, but you know, mm. hey, be some good stuff. Holiday week is a holiday week. Yeah, it is a holiday week. But the good thing about Thanksgiving, that you know this, is I love my Black Friday shopping. And I will be trying to find me an Xbox Series X because I have a good, decent gift card chilling in my Best Buy account that I'm ready to drop on the system. So, yeah. Well, if you can get it before the summer of twenty of next year, then more power to you. If not, you probably need to buckle up and kind of sit in because they're already announcing short. They're not expecting a uh, stock of either the PS five or the Xbox series X until mid 2021. Yeah. I think that's fine by me because from what I'm seeing and a lot of news I'm hearing in the gaming world, um, games are still going to be published on both systems for a while. Oh yeah. So, uh, but if I can get a hold of one, if you get a hold of one, yeah, cool. Yeah. And the cool thing is, is I read and saw how you can move your games from the Xbox One to the Series X. It should be pretty seamless. Cause Ooh, yeah, literally, you just put them on a hard drive and plug it in. That's what you literally have to do. No, that's good. I keep most of my games on a hard drive anyway. So, At least the ones I have downloaded. I was doing a big purge on my uh, hard drive space for my Xbox or earlier today. Yep. Yeah, but other than that, nothing else going on. Oh, you know, wow. just the, it's just heavy schoolwork. But once you get near the end of the semester, lots of reading, lots of papers. Well, I've been uh, kind of working through uh, some minis, uh, prepping up some minis. I think I'm gonna think I'm gonna try. And I'm gonna try this. I think I'm gonna try and paint a mini on Sunday morning for the first part of the show. And then play games on the second part. And with playing games this past week, I did a uh, Boulder's Gate three, and I actually got to an interesting point uh, for myself in playing Boulder's Gate, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I don't know. It's just getting those podcast episodes and watching those releases, um, and seeing and keeping things moving that way. So, and then of course we had our games on Saturday, which you know they were both they both had some interesting elements. I'd say they both had their. Both had their uh, moments where the parties were like, what did we get ourselves into? So <laughs> I guess party that feels on, good. Party on, party strong. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, uh, not a whole lot other than, you know, studio stuff. I did. I, I think I went out a couple of places, but nothing to really write home about. Mm -mm. Um, to be honest, don't really go. Don't really go out too much. DM tried to kill us. Is that true? I guess we'll find out in State of Game. Yes. Later, people. <laughs> Wait and see the truth. Let's roll the dice. Yeah, roll the dice. We got some stuff. We got stuff to talk about today. We got we're gonna talk about movies. We got uh we're gonna talk about Mansoon movie that Rye did a review on. We're gonna talk about Queen's Gambit, which is a series Rye did a did a Monsoon. review on. Monsoon? Yep. Monsoon. Monsoon. Yeah. And then for State of Game, we're going to talk about D&D &D and video games. Specifically, we're going to talk about our, I did say that right, our first impressions of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Wait, did you say our? I did say our, oh, as yeah. in I was playing, I, I actually was playing the game. Oh, yes. Gasp, shock, awe, all those things, because y'all know I have a hard time no, playing video I'm, games. I'm actually shedding a tear here because we can actually have a discussion about a video yes. game. <laughs> and we're going to talk D&D. &D. We'll talk about Shadow Watch and Challenge Accepted. And we will talk about the latest release of D&D &D material, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. I picked up my physical copy at the lo my local shop today, which is over in front of Rye. I did get the alternate cover. Because that just looks amazing, and we will we will move on. We will go on from there. Oh, yeah. So uh, with that, let's get into our reviews, right? Let's do it. All righty. First up, we have Monsoon. Yes, Monsoon. It is a uh, it's a foreign drama, an indie film, and one that is deemed in the film community as an art house film. Uh, Monsoon stars uh, Henry Golding. If you recognize that name, he was in um, uh, Crazy Rich Asians, 
A Simple Favor and a few other movies. And he plays a, a Vietnamese man who was in exile for 30 years in Great Britain and comes back uh, to fulfill his parents' wishes and bring their ashes back home. Uh, when he returns back to Vietnam after 30 years, he knows he's pretty much a, a fish out of water. Um, all the stuff that of his homeland he's unfamiliar with. So not only is he trying to bring you know bring his ashes of his parents back home, he's trying to find a way to reconnect back to his home country. And that's where the story picks up. And if you heard me earlier, I said this is an art house film. And for anybody that, that, that follows film or know, understands what that term means is that it goes against the typical stylings, outlines, and structures of a typical uh, film. There's not a traditional three act mo movement. There's not tra uh, traditional uh, archetypes or tropes or, you know, elegant way of making action set pieces go bombastic or overly dramatic scenes feel remote romantic to some degree. Um, it's very much placed in minimal aesthetics. So what you have is a lot of moments where the character is sitting, standing, watching, observing, uh, slight conversing with other people. And you're seeing the, his world, uh, through his eyes as the audience member, you're not observing as a third party. You are like you're him. And it's really good that they approach this film this way because using a simple aesthetic, you get to see this like conflict of a Vietnamese man trying to reconnect with Vietnam. So there's this conflict of, you know, interests where he doesn't know where he fits in, even though he is from Vietnam. And along the way, he recon reconnects with an old friend, Lee, pl played by actor David Tran, and he co uh, comes in contact with a new romantic lover, uh, Lewis, played by Parker Sawyer. And through these two interactions and relationship, he starts to build that connection back to Vietnam while also trying to find his own identity. So there's a little mixture of self-discovery, a little mixture of romance, a little mixture of, you know... Um, coming coming of age in a sense but it's done through that visual aesthetic of just watching observing so once you get through the film you're just kind of living the journey and the one thing about art house films is that you live the experience so you're you're taking in the sounds in the conversation and anything that's considered typical exposition isn't force fed you just kind of have to pick up on the cues through each of the scenes mm. so once it gets near the end, because uh, he has to travel from Saigon to Hanoi, and you're pretty much going from scene to scene trying to, you know, engross yourself in this world. And it's really cool because it allows the culture, allows the society to guide you and to assimilate you into becoming, you know, one with the place. So you're watching and growing at the same time as the main character. And it's really good. So once it comes all the way to the end, it kind of just ends on a very pristine note, not a typical happy ending, just kind of like you drop in and you drop out. So slice of life kind of deal. Yeah, slice of life kind of thing. So okay. any 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 questions for me, Scuba? Not really on this one. No. I mean, where can we find this? Uh, this is on Amazon Prime. Um, okay. You can rent it for pretty cheap. It's five ninety nine. So if you wanted to rent it, I would say check it out. Um, but overall, um. The rating I'm giving it is because of the emphasis that this is an art house film. It's m much in the vein of you have to appreciate the art and aesthetic of film. What is what is an art house? An art house film is one that is a reliance on everything else instead of just being dictated by gimmicks. So it's uh, visual cues. It's the scene. It's the, um, the, the stage presence. It's the environment. There is a point in this film, I'll break it down, when he comes in contact with his uh, old friend Lee, and they're speaking Vietnamese. Normally, in traditional films, you would see that in subtitles, French, German, Indian, um, Russian. You'll see Russian, and you'll see English, or whatever the language is. You don't see that, because you're seeing the view through his point of view, where he comes out and says, I can't understand Vietnamese as well anymore, which makes the scene even more genuine, because oh, you don't know okay. what he... He's only picking up on the cues. And another thing is, it, it, it threw me off in the beginning, but when you're watching this film, the sounds of the environment are louder than the conversations. So when you're out in the streets, you hear the mopeds, you hear the city sounds and all the different stuff, and it kind of is leveled above the conversations, but it's giving it in a realistic approach. So it's you're, you're supposed to hear it like that because you're not... When you're in a crowded city, 
you're not going to hear your conversation even if you're face to face with somebody. So, yeah, which in most most media, most film that we de- yeah. that we deal with, it's oh, all other sound is stripped away yeah. so we can focus on, on the these two people okay. having a conversation. Or if um just to use one of my favorite trilogies, Lord of Rings, a lot of the scenes are prompted up by the score instead of the actual scene. And that's what uh, on our house film focuses on is the visual cues and puts the puts the the intelligence of the of the viewer at play instead of making you feel dumb. So and okay. it's 3.5 out of 5 matinee. So All right. That's what I was trying to get to. So. I know you're trying to get to it. I was just it it, yeah. it really didn't seem all that I mean, I guess maybe again cuz I'm not very familiar with yeah. what an art house oh, yeah. film is as opposed to oh, yeah. You know, like a blockbuster yeah, or yeah. kind of de- a blockbuster yeah. film or something like that, or an indie film. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's why. Yeah, once you said that, that's why I broke it down because that's the those are the two main things that you'll notice in this film, and that's a, a an appreciative factor of an art house is on the art instead of trying to make it a gimmick. So, okay, strip out the gimmicks, make yeah. it make it enjoyable. Yeah, well, I can dig that. Check it out, Amazon Prime people. Alrighty, so the other film that you did a review, or not so much a film, Miniseries. but a series, mm-hmm. was Queen's Gambit. Yes. Now this is a Netflix miniseries. Yes, Netflix original miniseries. Now is it how many episodes is it? It's only seven episodes. And um, is it capped to like one and seven, or does it look like this is a series where we get through seven, we might get a season two? Um, it's capped. It's capped. So it's this it. is miniseries if they do do a season two it's going to be forced in but this is capped oh that's the worst kind yeah but um the queen's gambit is a fictional story that follows uh the life of an orphan uh chess prodigy um beth Harmon, played by anna taylor joy uh if you know that name you can recognize her from the witch um new mutants and a few other things um and she plays this uh that's right she was the uh she was the 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 Witchblade girl in uh, New Mutants. Yes. Um, okay. So, and you follow in the in each of the episodes, you watch her story as she she becomes this chess prodigy, and <laughs> and then eventually comes a uh, plays chess against some of the elites in the game during the mid nineteen fifties into the nineteen sixties. Um, but outside of the chess, um, what you come to realize is her struggle and dependence on drugs and alcohol and just her low societal functionality because the only way she's able to you know be a part of society is through chess and you watch how in this series on how the chess brings her closer to certain characters in the film um builds friendship with people that were eventually adversaries per se when they fight become friends and you're just watching a a typical like hero's tale rags to riches story but done in a very more humble and genuine way they strip back all the i'm going to keep using this word it's going to be a broken rubber gimmicks of those tropes and allows you to follow the character as is so each episode focuses on her you know slowly working up her ranks slowly you know understanding chess and stuff but also tackling uh, social issues uh, social issues and personal issues when it involves her mother her stepmother her best friend from the orphanages and how to what romanticism is um her mother her stepmother her orphan best friend yeah um and then in the first episode um this ain't really a spoiler it's literally in the first five minutes um she becomes an orphan because her mother kills herself um, so she gets sent to an orphanage and then from there she gets adopted. And then that leads into a, 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 a story with her stepmother. So there's a lot of relationship drama. There's a lot of like character growth and because of chess, chess is what helps her connect with each of these characters. It helps her build up her, 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 her personal growth helps her, you know, fight her struggle with drug abuse. Cause there's an interesting twist on what, how drugs are in this film and also romantic relationships so not only are they doing the chess side they're also building the character and paralleling it that way and Mm. the great thing is is the acting is some of the best i've seen in a tv series to date in this show everybody is on point everybody goes beyond anything that you would see in a trope on a hero's tale um and just you every character is unique identifiable and important they're not just there for plot armor they are important 
to character growth not only to themselves but to beth Harmon. and then so there's I, no there's no character in this that doesn't have a purpose and this goes back to you know why we why i'm appreciating the mandalorian this season is that every scene is written without fluff it's important so yeah it's probably one of the best series i've seen this year cool yeah all righty well, I definitely might need to go check this out. I did see a couple of tweets about that from uh, some people I follow. So, oh yeah, I I saw a lot of people. It was writing. I think the last time I saw on Rotten Tomatoes, a hundred percent. I'm sorry. Say that again. A hundred percent. The last time I saw it, might have dropped down a little bit, but when when they dropped this series, which dropped on the 23rd of October, it was writing a hundred percent approval. Okay. So. Oh, what well, what is the rise scale? Rise scale uh, for TV, I would rate this a four point five out of five, and the only reason is is because in the the last episode, it does do some of the conveniences of wrapping up that you see in typical storytelling, but it doesn't take away from the overall enjoyment. So okay. four point five out of five. Sweet. All righty. Well, that was. Fun. Oh, now yeah. we can get into state of game. State of game. State of game. <sighs> so, state of game is that point where we talk about the various games we are playing and what we are playing and how we are playing. Average audience score is ninety six. So, so it only dropped what four percent. That's yeah. not terrible. Yeah. More people reviewed it. More people looked at it. I like it. Oh yeah. Definitely. Thank you, Shad. Always a pleasure when the mods are in the room. <laughs> oh, but the tomato read, uh, uh, meter is still at 100. So the critics are 100%. The audience, audience is, is at 96. 96. That's, that's pretty good parallel. That is that that's telling you. Um Alrighty, so as far as our state of game this week, we have a couple of things we're going to hit on. Uh traditionally we talk about video games first and then we get into tabletop games. Uh so we're going to roll through uh what did we not play? What did we play aside from Valhalla before we get into Valhalla? What did we play uh, outside of Valhalla? Um, crickets, tumbleweed, nothing. Okay. <laughs> I, I played a little bit more of uh, Baldur's Gate 3. And I got to a point in Baldur's Gate 3 where everywhere I went, I got killed. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I only followed you for a little bit and then I had to finish my assignments. Well, I, figuring out leveling and getting around in BG3 is a little slow. I mean, I did explore the map a little bit and there's some definite interesting political um, turmoil in dealing with some of the races. Like I had to go to a goblin camp and to try and find somebody and couldn't really. And at first I, I my intimidation didn't my my diplomacy didn't work so i ended up getting killed so i was like all right let me go back and rest and then got propositioned by a d by a devil i think i'm level three or four i think i'm level three or four on uh boulders gate three right now so but yeah and then went back with now that you have those illithid illithid things you could do to force a conversation into your way and I was like, oh, okay, got through here, and then couldn't find this person or couldn't find that person. And I was like, oh. Okay. I was just had a heck of a time and ended up I actually started getting bored with it. It's a great game. I love that I do I do really enjoy the game, but I think for me, because if it doesn't keep flowing very well, I tend to get bored with it. And I felt that, you know, on str uh, as far as I may play some more of it offline for a little bit till I get a little bit further along, but I actually started to get bored with the game. So eh, great game. I do like the early access. It's just, I've got to figure out cause I think my, I, I ended up going down a well into a cavern and then picked a fight with some face spiders and some other creatures. And yeah, that didn't end well. I, mean, I was just, I was having a really rough time. It's like I must have died and reload like three times, and <laughs> I'm not in a very good spot right now. Yeah, you must, it must have happened after I uh, jumped off because yeah, it, you were it, dying it, when I was on. It, it wasn't pretty. It was <laughs> not pretty. Not pretty. But, you know. Hey, well, at least you're getting it in and getting, you know, some fun into it. I will. I mean, I was keep pushing through, so I may keep pushing forward, like they say, but. Of course, the big thing is talking about Assassin's Creed Valhalla. 
Valhalla. Now, I watched the Gamer's Little Playground game movie on this, so I know how the story progresses. And the full video, if you're curious to watch this, all the parts is about 23 hours long. Now, if you're not familiar, Game is a Little Playground, when they do these game movies, they include relevant gameplay and they stretch out to go through. So you're not feeling like jerky jerky from uh, one cutscene to the next. You actually have dialogue and everything to where it feels like a cinematic experience. In fact, that their video was 23 hours long. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, Lord, there's a lot to this, but somewhat familiar with it now i was very curious uh i have friends who have the game um who uh see shadow mains is in the chat right now um he said he he was talking last night he's like 32 hours in yeah. <laughs> i'm like where'd you find 32 yeah, hours it's only been out for a week is uh has a lot of hours in on top of writing a paper so <laughs> lots of one and two AMs. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, of course you got it. So you were playing your first impressions. Well, I was looking and I found a bundle. Oh yeah. That was the Microsoft morning. store. We were talking about it and you were like, Hmm. And I poked the bear and you said, okay. <laughs> well, I found a bundle in the Microsoft store. You could get Assassin's Creed origins, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and you could get Valhalla for $160. It's a pretty good price people. When you think about it. Um, so I was like, well, I don't have any of these. The last game, the last Assassin's Creed game I bought was Syndicate. I've never played it. I bought it with the intent to get into it, but never got into it. The, I did play the original Assassin's Creed for a little bit, and I did play Black Flag and Black Flag's control c scheme. And I think there was a mission early on where you have to try and follow somebody and hop from roof to roof to roof without getting caught. I couldn't get that down and I got frustrated and I just put the game down and never looked back. But I have pretty much all of the franchise up till, you know, up till a couple, there's a couple of small ones I don't have, but yeah. the majority of the major releases, I have them on Steam and Xbox and whatever. So I was like, mm, okay. I'm, my wife is a big fan of the Assassin's Creed franchise. She's, big fan. She's, she might still be playing it. Uh, yeah, she's probably playing it. That was the other reason why it motivated me, because I have the way we have it set up is any game I bought, she'll be able to play because the way they allow your home device to share with another console in the house, if it, if you, depending on which one you log in, which one you have set as your yeah. home device. <laughs> but... So I'd started and I got into it and I spent the afternoon playing. So I've got maybe four hours in so far. And yeah, I'm loving it. I'm actually really enjoying it. The combat mechanic is a little easier for me to handle than the last one I played. And I literally spent, I think as far as story wise, I have gotten to the point where you have to Sigurd, your your brother, your your adopted brother has come home. You meet the two guys from this. You meet two guys who you get your hidden blade. You learn how to use it. You take out a couple of bad guys with it. And then you move on to the next major plot point. Four hours. That's as far as I got because I ended up just on that first one where it's like, hey, I've got to go talk to the the mystic. So I got to go find the mystics house and spend a whole day night cycle wandering around the woods, climbing cliffs, doing little world side missions before I even got to that, <laughs> to that point. But combat mechanics is a lot easier for me to pick up on this one. The progression, uh, the, it, really does feel a little easier and i'm probably going to jump back into it when we get done here i'm not going to lie because it was refreshing to get into it and now normally i don't buy triple a titles at launch because you know reasons but this is the first one in a while outside of boulder skate 3 that i picked up and of course boulder skate 3 is early access on pc this is on my xbox console and it took probably about 40 minutes on my studio xbox to download 
it took almost two hours to download on the other Xbox in the other room. And of course I had to spend like 40 minutes clearing storage space. Cause it's like a 60, 40 gig, 40 plus gig on the initial 40, download. I think, yeah, it's like 42, 40 something, but yeah. So Ryan, what about you? I am, like I said, off air, or you might've heard it before, but uh, in comparison to the other two Odyssey and Origins, I'm going to have to wait till I complete the game and get through all the other content to see if it is my favorite Assassin's Creed game. Um, from the ground up, the, they have um, refined the combat and the skill development of the previous two. So this game is a good... Uh, it's found the balance of you know RPG, of action, and adventure. I think that this game is the trifecta of what they were trying to go, you know, what they was potential in Origins, which Origins is a fantastic game, but they found a way to build upon that and do something different with the origin, uh, the origin tree with the skill tree. Because in the previous two, um, when you were doing building out your tree with your skills, you would unlock your special skills. This time around in this game, um, they separated that. So your skill tree is built on attributes. So you're strengthening certain attributes depending on if you go yellow, red, or blue. Um, I'm doing mostly yellow with some red. Um, but when it comes to getting your like special skills, these these things around the world called the Book of Knowledge, which you pick them up and it allows you to stack your specials either on melee combat or on archery and it's it's really not hard to find them and it actually adds into the exploration aspect of assassin's creed because that's the emphasis of the whole series is the exploration and by separating this that your special skills from the skill tree it adds even more depth to the exploration not on top of the fact that there is already extensive of stuff that you can find squirrel moments in this game and on top of that the rating system with the vikings which you'll get to once you get to england is amazing and the deeper you go into building your um your village in england the more it opens up on your customization when it comes to rating and it comes to skills and buffs and a lot of different other stuff um and what's cool about it it's a very methodical progression and you're slowly you have to building alliances with different places so you can expand into england and there's areas you can try to go to, but if your power and skill isn't up to it, you're going to get slaughtered. <laughs> I haven't done that yet, but I might end up doing that just because if I get squirrel moments in the wrong area, I might die. But it's amazing that the way they do the side quest too isn't forced into uh, the game. Like, well, that's... I mean, there's no character standing there with a yellow exclamation mark over the top of his head? Nope, there isn't. You're just kind of like, you're just going, this is, it has the same feel with The Witcher 3, where you're just going along and you see people either screaming or, you know, crying or they are having conversations. Like one, there's like these two brothers that think that they are the Ragnar the Ragnarok sons and you know that they're not, but you decide to help them anyway. And they're just a bunch of fools that think they're good at Vikings, but they're not. So you burn down a house and help them out but you really didn't want to. One of my favorite side missions so far is, is the cat lady, um, the crazy cat lady. Um, you have to use her cats to get the rats out of the field for the old guy because the old guy um, is just stubborn to talk to the old lady. Um, and then the other one was the mission where you're chasing down a white elk and flying through the air because you're tripping on mushrooms. Um, yeah, so... But other than that, it's really, the story is in-depth. Character, it's very character-driven. Um, there's a lot of choices in this game, and you have to make the right choice in certain situations. Um, choices matter de uh, depending on the outcome. Especially one of the first alliances that you make, because you really have to figure out who the traitor is. So. Oh, yeah. I, I remember that from, the, from that and seeing how that goes, and hopefully don't make the wrong choice. Oh, yeah. And there's just this, just so much, um, there's just so much to do and you just kind of just, um, this is probably the most beautiful Assassin's Creed I've seen to date. And it just, it begs the question in my mind, which I've been thinking is like, how much beautiful is it going to be in the series X uh, running without the load times? It's just going to be amazing once I can get a hold of one. But up until this point, it's been great. 
it's um it does that good balance for me um balancing not going too much rpg or too much action there's that balance where there's enough development where there's worth in the customization worth in um leveling your weapons and stuff because that's the one thing that people complain about was the bloat in odyssey so they pull that back and now you get your weapons and you can level up your weapons and add different runes and different attributes to your weapons depending on how you want to fight so yeah i ended up uh so far i, I as far as those side missions it was one about trying to find a comb I did that one. <laughs> and it, I, I, I was really kind of struggling with that because the riddle is a little, was a little hard for me to figure out. Oh, yeah. I'd be honest. I Googled it, but still hey, it's it fine. was, you know, I, I wasn't bad. And then of course the hunting and all that, which I like all that open world type stuff more than the story. Oh yeah. But we were talking earlier and it, I really got a good, I really got a strong Skyrim vibe. Mm hmm off of this in the yeah. sense that when you look at the when you're looking at the top the, the, the little uh, navigation wheel as you kind of turn about that has little icons and the way the icons look it, it really felt more like skyrim and for me that made me feel more comfortable playing because i didn't feel it's like it didn't feel like i really had to try and understand too much more but the tutorial, uh, the tutorial, the database, all that stuff is really helpful for looking through. But I spent a whole, uh, the, the, as far as the gorgeousness, the game is very gorgeous. The yeah. textures uh, on your environment are amazing. Like you seeing the snow gather around you as you trape through the snow, jumping into the water and actually freezing as you're in the water. And then getting out and, and spending some time soaking wet in the cold. I mean, that that's some nice elements. And then, of course, the whole day-night cycle yeah, where you actually get to watch. If you stand still, you watch your shadow shift as the sun comes up and over. I thought those were really nice. Now, maybe they've been having it in other games. I just haven't played a lot of newer games. But, you know, a simple person, simple enjoyment, you know, as far as story and game development. I thought it was really good. And I'm looking forward to just kind of seeing where the wind takes me so to oh, speak yeah. it, it's it's a great appreciation of the detail that they put in this game because they did put a lot of detail in this game they definitely built up the medieval ages once you get to england you'll see um and it it it, it strokes it does a good balance of being historical and being imaginative at the same time and it makes me look forward to the dlcs for this game which have been announced that they're going to be ireland and paris so um. Forty dollars for the season pass does not seem like a terrible price, considering rumor has it that mm -hmm. this game is roughly sixty hours in story on the base game. Hmm, maybe I'm I'll hold off on Cyberpunk because you know they'll probably push the release date again. So maybe uh, we'll see. We shall see. But yeah, overall so far I'm enjoying it. Um I'm not gonna I'm not gonna jump on when I get home because I do have to get up and work. But tomorrow's another day. <laughs> yeah, normally Wednesday I do video editing, but I don't know. I'll have to try and juggle and, you know, do some adulting first, maybe. So uh, uh, the people in the chat, the ones that played the game, um, Shadow Main, what do you think of the game? What are your, what are your uh, pros? I know you said you did 32 hours. Um, 32 hours. Yeah, that's a lot. I don't know how many hours I've done. I'm not really paying. I don't pay attention to it. I just kind of just navigate. I know I'm heading into East Anglia next. So I probably would have still played except the fact that I had to shut it down so I could go to the, my local game store to pick up some paint and and a book. But uh, yeah, it was it, it was a nice change to actually sit there and do that versus, you know. Oh, yeah, this definitely will workaholic type oh, yeah. things like life, life balance stuff yeah work-life balance i get i get you know i profess that and i get told down when i try to work too much too by co-workers so <laughs> well I, I will say the positive thing is i actually got my monitors rearranged like i now have a dedicated one the dedicated one i use for the capture card with the pc i now have it set to where i can use it for the xbox too so i could probably be in the middle of one i could probably multitask on one thing and while a video is compiling play play uh play games while and still working through my youtube feed because i've been binge watching painting tutorials 
<laughs> this particular series of tutorials I've been watching, and I think then they're roughly two hours a piece, and back to back to back. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely. Um, I look forward to seeing uh, how you uh, enjoy the England part, all the stuff on there. So. Well, we shall see if I make it to England by next week, by the time we get done with the holiday. Oh yeah, I'm off next week, so guess what I'm be doing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we can just do. Maybe we. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure if we want to do a show with Thanksgiving week or just take Thanksgiving week off. Up to you. Yeah. Well. We'll see how it goes. Alrighty. So aside from so we got we we did that one. Yes. Uh the other thing is on the tabletop side of the house where we had our uh had the two D D games on Saturday. So Saturdays are in getting interesting. Like uh we'll start with Shadow Watch. Shadow Watch is doing a module called Shards of the Day, where they have to go into this abandoned dwarven city. Duolanian or something like that. I can't even pronounce it. I have to look up an, enun an enunciation at some point. But the party uh, made start make started making their way in, and they got into the first, and they they had to deal with a couple more sword spiders, and then move in, <laughs> move into the first. Um, now the way this place is set up, and uh, honestly, I don't think I can do it justice without showing you guys. So, yeah, I really can't do it justice without showing you. I mean, but um, the way they designed this module back in second in, for in Dungeon Magazine is it, it had a printout of these hex hexagons. The idea was that you would photocopy it and then cut them out, and when you're at the table, you'd lay a hex down, and that's where the party was was in. Each hex was supposed to represent some 500 feet. And then kind of carry yourself along. Well, the party got into the first hex, which is this big giant statue. And as they're going, they come across, and now each hex is supposed to have a random encounter. Now, the thing I like about this particular random encounter table is the last option on the table is DM's choice. <laughs> so um so i was like all right well i know where i'm gonna pull stuff from if i get to that but being this is the underdark you've got all the underdark baddies every one of them has some opportunity to make a presence well the party comes in and you know the deep gnomes that they're with have 120 feet of night vision the party with the exception of one character only has 60 feet so it's one of those I can they can see to a point and then everything kind of goes dark and then these guys can see further. Mm -hmm. Well, they saw something that scared the ever living crap out of them. And they're like, no, we're leaving. Mm -hmm. The party, on the other hand, decides to form a line to engage whatever it is that they see. Turns out what they were engaging with was a pat was a was a pair of mind flares with trolls. Thrall, troll thralls under their under their control so yeah the party had a had a had a kind of a rough go of it because but they had they squared off with six trolls and killed them all relatively quickly um in doing so one of the party members decided to let off a solar flare in this room which lit up all the tunnels <laughs> as kind of a hi we're your new neighbors Got a cup of sugar, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they'll be moving in, and they they now have to they have to navigate to get to this deep gnome enclave. Downside is is the route's probably going to be like six or eight of these tiles, so if they've got six or eight encounters, they have to navigate through, and they're already getting stretched pretty thin as far as resources because they haven't been traveling that they, they they've. They're just about to the point they need a long rest as far as time wise, but there's a whole, but they've got to find a place that's safe for them to hold up for eight hours. Oh yeah. But it should be interesting. Uh, again, that's Saturday mornings at 10 AM and then challenge accepted. They finally, finally got to a major milestone. What's that? 
Um, it was the fifth victim in a murder most foul, which is the first section of the adventure. Okay. Uh, they 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 got to they they actually caught the killer in the act and thought they were gonna do great until the kill until uh, some mishaps happened and the party realized that you know just when they thought they were getting closer they're getting more confused by the craziness that's going on because they squared off with another group of jackal wares and the murderer got away but <laughs> they got a major clue that they can follow up on really? to figure out where to where to go next in the next phase of the adventure so but it it wasn't bad i mean Apparently, I I finally got uh, a voice that I could do for a character that everybody loved. Okay. Um, they wanted to from the last session. They wanted to go and check out. Uh, they wanted to go talk to the medical examiner about the fourth victim. So I was like, okay, how am I going to do this? Well, I figured he's going to be a gnome, and I figured out a name, and then I was like, all right, well, okay, let's let's trying to come up with a voice and apparently the voice worked out really well it's like this guy is like i really don't think i want to know try to trying to do something like this isn't very good but you know it was fun it was great these guys are really coming together as a group they're really moving forward uh, a lot of creative antics the tricksters are influencing the game like i could not believe and really enjoying it because with those games we can you can you can actually influence what happens in the game by donating channel points or throwing bits on the live streams and then there are times it pulls the party out of danger because you know the tricksters can which are the viewers they can you know give heals and help keep the party alive and in the fight which is great too because you know never bad sometimes decisions are made <laughs> You know, you know, you leave the decisions up to the role and the role just says no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It has its moments. Uh, moments, people. Moments. Speaking of moments. So that's the game recap. I didn't have any other games to talk about for the weekend because uh, due to some changes, my wife wasn't feeling good. So uh, the sat the Sunday group that normally meets once a month, they weren't able to actually come over. But I think as a group decided to move into the virtual space. So they're going to continue on with Roll20 and doing a Dungeon of the Mad Mage. And I think we're going to set up to do a session on the 29th. So I should have something for you first, first part of December to see how they're going. Should be fun. But there are some things I want to revamp for some builds because the latest uh, source book for Dungeons and Dragons came out. That is Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. It was released uh, digitally uh, via D&D via D &D Beyond at 9 p.m. Pacific yesterday. This is it, people. And the physical books were, of course, out to your local game shops. And I pre-ordered mine at the beginning of the month. Now, this is really cool. This is a really interesting book because it really has a lot of new rules and new options. And we've seen a lot of video. There have been a lot of videos out to talk about what based on press releases and this and that talking about what's going to be in the book, which is great. But I'm one of those. I actually want to actually look at the book to talk about what's actually in the print versus, you know, the releases. Not to say the releases aren't bad. It's just, you know, it's not how, not quite how I roll. So. What do you say we take a look at this book? At least the digital version of it. And yeah. Let's take a look at it. So we're going to pull up there. And so I actually have mine out here. So kind of zoom in. There's a lot of interesting things in here. Like. Just right off, that's right off going through it, customizing your origin. This is talking about how normally when you create a character in D&D, you, depending on the race you choose, that race gets a particular stat bonus. Uh, the example they use, they threw here is like dwarves typically get a plus two to constitution because they're trying to go with the archetype of the hero who can take a beating and keep on going. And with uh, 
building a character, your constitution dictates your hit point count. And all the other races have these various bonuses, all based on certain average societal expectations for the society that that race comes from. But feeling that, but in with some of these new trends and trying to work the customization with this, when they introduced a new, a, a new rule, which allows you to change up that character, that choice. So what it is, what they're talking about doing here is if you have a, if your race on average gets a particular bonus, you can then take that bonus and apply it to a different stat to based on what your viewing of your character build is. Uh, the only conditions they throw in here is you cannot uh, take both stat increases and apply it to the same stats. You okay. have to you have to shift it. If it's a plus two, it stays a plus two. If it's a plus one, it's a plus one. You just get to choose which ability you apply it to. So that's going to open things up. Like I tend to play de a lot of de I tend to play some character like my cleric Tamazar. He's a dex based cleric. He's not so much strength based, but like most traditional clerics. But you know something like this could allow me to shift the stats around to kind of help that out. The other thing that they're changing as far as customizing your background is the languages. Normally you have like a dwarf will speak dwarvish in common. Again, average uh, perception of this. So now it's like, oh, well, what if I'm a dwarf who never grew up in dwarven society? Would I still know dwarvish or would I know something else? So this this opens that up for for that as well. Um, and then they change like they actually have rules in here for changing your subclass and changing spells. One of the biggest spell things that we've had people discuss is okay. I'm a magic user. I get cantrips. Well, typically based on the original PHP rules, your cantrip is your cantrip. You don't get to change it. Mm -mm. Now they have rules in here that says, okay, well, when I level up and I get to a level point that I can adjust my ability scores, now I can change out my cantrips. Same thing with now you can, if you're a dru if you're like a, a druid that has a particular uh, circle of druid circle, you can now, when you get to that, get to a level where your druid circle abilities uh, uh, increase, you can instead take that opportunity to change to another druid circle and get all of the benefits for that new circle. So that's an interesting bit. It allows you to, I think it allows you to kind of, allows a character to kind of shift. Plus, again, you can add to the character's story. They got a great example in here of a pal of a, of a, of a cleric who was of a, or no, actually, no, this was a, a wizard. A wizard of a particular school of magic happens to fall asleep under a tree and starts having visions and then wakes up and now is study is, is now proficient in divine, shifted his subclass to divination versus conjuration. Those kinds of things are very, are, are really kind of cool for opening it up in my mind. Cause I know a lot of players are going to work on different things. Also, we took a lot of stuff from the Unearthed Arcana, put it in print, put it published. Um, a great one, because I've had a lot of experience with this as far as clerics, is Clerics of the Twilight Domain. This one was kind of broken for a while to me, because Twilight Domain allows you to see in dark vision, but in the UA version of it, you had no distance cap. Now, in this, the Twilight Domain gives you 300 feet of vision, which is still ridiculous distance. But again, you know, we have we, we put some boundaries. Um, there's a revamp on the Artificer stuff. I don't play a lot of Artificer, so I can't really speak to that. But the Armor and the Artillerist and the Battles, th those would be interesting. Um, there's a couple of new... Uh, New call, new bard class, colleges, College of Creation, and the College of Eloquence. Um, of course, a lot of other great 
uh, changes. But then over here on the back end of the book, um, some new, some new, some of the unearthed arcana spells that are now in here. Um, they have some rules. They have the magic tattoos, which are a great concept because it's you can get yourself completely tattooed up with, and it's all counts as one magical item. And then each of those tattoos can do different things. But the dungeon master tools are the part that I'm really kind of excited about because I was reading through some of these this morning. We actually have some information on the sidekicks and some of the restrictions on sidekicks. And I may introduce a few sidekicks to my for my parties. The first one being right here, any creature that has a stat block in the monster manual or other D&D book with a challenge rating of one half or lower can become a sidekick. And the sidekick levels up with the average party level of the of the party. So that's interesting. And then, of course, they have specific uh, focuses, whether and they make it easier for the stat blocks. Like if your person is supposed to be an expert in something, it already lists out all their stat blocks and everything. So before so I have a I have a sidekick that one group is using. And he's based on a fur bog. Now I may not tweak him much, but if I add a sidekick to challenge accepted, I can now quickly throw together a sidekick. And if he survives the encounter, great. If he doesn't, oh well, we can add more to this. Um, and then of course they have a, a another great bit they added is these group patrons. Yeah, that was one thing I noticed in here. Yeah, the, the patron's nice because he, or at least till you find someone to bring into the bring into the adventure. Chili's question is, is so someone backs out of a campaign, just add a sidekick to help them till the end of the campaign. Essentially, yeah. Sidekicks were introduced originally in the Essentials Kit, because the Essentials Kit had rules for doing D D sessions with one or two people. Traditionally, Dungeons & Dragons plays best when you have a party of four or five at the table. Sometimes you can't do that, obviously. And, you know, so this allows you the essentials kit had options for you to run a session one on one where you could give the player sidekicks and have them run the sidekicks to help out the part, help, help them out as they get through. There's a couple of basic sidekick cards that were established there. And then now this has some more opened up rules, like any, as it says, any creature that has a challenge rating of one half or lower that has a stat block in the monster manual can be turned into a sidekick. So interesting options there. Um, and it's the, one of the funny, and then of course we get back to the patrons and the way these group patrons work is like, you could actually, and one of my, one of the groups actually inadvertently is already falling into this, having a group patron. Um, at first it was the guild that had hired them to clear out the gap. So, and, and for that, they've got this letter of Mark that gives them half price on everything in the city. That actually falls in line with one of the uh, example patrons, which is a guild of some type. And then they were hired by somebody else. So this is this is a, a person or an organization that hires the party to give them a shared goal to accomplish. Um, challenge accepted can be argued as they have a patron who put them on their path to Paradon to get the knife. Um, so that. That's some interesting things. It helps me flesh out the the emerald the emerald lady to be that patron person who funds these various adventuring groups to do their ver to do their thing. And then we get in here to the dungeon master tools. One of the things I thought was really kind of hilarious looking at it is the fact you can actually have ways to have a party get themselves out of an encounter without fighting the beast <laughs> by help by them actually going through like monster research, actually giving suggested skills for figuring out what might be the monster's intent and then trying to, uh, and then a set of desires and grand, this is random. So most of these are really simple, quick D four. What's that monster want? 
And can the party figure out what the monster wants to try and avoid having to fight it? Which I think is kind of cool. Um, obviously, dragons, it's pretty, pretty self-evident there. But there's... <laughs> There are some creatures. Run. There are some creatures that it's just hilarious. Like here's one for monstrosities, making movements to mimic the monsters mating. It really? I mean, <laughs> okay, okay. Let's have some. Let Let's get a little goofy with this. Uh, plants destroy all axes and fire making implements the party carries. Believable. Maybe. <laughs> Um, the, the undead one seems kind of easy. A personal memento of the creature's past. Good luck finding that. <laughs> sunproof, uh, to sunproof a mausoleum. I mean, that's kind of cool. <laughs> You're right. It, it, Chili's comment, it may get you into more trouble. That's very true. It could possibly get you into trouble, but I think that's where the fun goes. Yeah, when you get in trouble, that's when you just, um, Yeah. First, then we have these supernatural regions, which I have to, I still have to kind of look through. I kind of glanced through quite a bit of it, but supernatural regions, far realm. Yeah, I think this is like magical phenomenon. Haunted. I've got a party in the underdark. This is just screams like this could be fun to mess with. Mirror zone. So, yeah. I'm so far, initial impressions of this book. I think it's really awesome and interesting. And I'm looking forward to diving through it some more and seeing how some of that stuff could be applied to my current games. Uh, I already got a message from one of my players. Uh, they're a wizard. Um, they had an op the, under the Order of Scribes and they have the Awakened Spellbook. Well, based on the UA stuff, and now with the now that it's published, converting the UA to the published, there's some things to adjust. But definitely recommend it's definitely same vein as Xanathar's got everything. I think if you're doing character creation, this should be an essential source book that you get your hands on to go with your player's handbook, Xanathar's. And then this, you can totally build out some really wild. Xanathar's helped you build really wild characters. Mm -hmm. This makes you list this, this uh, lets you build out really wild wild creatures oh yeah there's a lot of variety of creatures in that book but anything, also... anything jump out at you i know you've had, literally i picked up the book maybe three hours ago yeah. or five hour three five hours ago from the game shop because i had it pre-ordered and they sent me the message saying it was ready for pickup <laughs> but did you see anything that caught, caught your eye rye um i i like the, the 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 customizations how you can move the skills around Mm -hmm. uh, that that patron section was the one that caught me, so I was like looking through that more extensively than the other sections, because it's really cool that you have a you have something that can that that can um center the mission. I'm just gonna use words. Mm -hmm. The centers the missions and a variety of different patrons that can center it and have influences with very endearing consequences. Like I know there was one about a criminal syndicate. Um, mm -hmm. I was looking in there, so that one caught my eye. It's just interesting how there the variety goes beyond just building your skills, but you can put variety in patrons and sidekicks and enemies types. Yeah, the types of criminal criminal syndicates stuff, stuff that looks more than just the typical you know D and D stuff that that the, I know of. Yeah, your your thin your syndicate types, and then that's the fact you get the perks. Like if you have this group patron, some of the perks, um and it's hilarious like let's look at the guild one because i have a party that deals with it that has a that is essentially if i'm looking at this right they could they could be you know a merchants a merchants consortium um in one of the cities so some of the perks they've got there is like equipment i they got a bunch of ha handy haversacks, uh, resources, training. I mean, so these are all and guilt and contacts. Yeah, this it seems like this could right there could jump right in for some of the stuff with uh with uh, yeah. one of the groups. 
Yeah, it definitely looks like fun. It adds more, you know, building story, building content. Yeah. Building the world. Um, yeah, the the world building, I think, is... Yeah, I agree with you. The world building is going to be nuts. Man, because, you know, when you're playing RPG, you know, or D&D, you know you have your standards, this, this, and this, and it seems like it kind of, you know, it does quirks enough to where it takes that um, imagination and broadens it. Mm-hmm. More. Just, mm-hmm. uh, just, just simple quirks. It's not like it's going far out reaching. It's just, just, just a slight quirk here, slight quirk here. Just those little changes is expanding what you, you know. Yeah. Ex- expanded some feats, magic items. There's even uh in the book. There's actually it looks like there's some creatures that you can look at as well. But yeah, the artwork is pretty cool. And did a little research uh, on Tasha. Uh, she is one of the OG archmages of D and D. Um, she's right in there in the same class as uh, Mordekainen and Elminster. Yeah. Which uh, for D and D lore, uh, Mordekainen obviously is the uh, player character for Gary Gygax. So he's been around a long time. And then uh, Elminster is one of the uh, old OG uh, um, archmages who's pretty predominant in Faerun. Tasha and Mordekainen are more of the uh, Greyhawk uh, setting. I can't comment on that, Chili, but I imagine that conversation is not far off. And nor am I committing to any of that, but <laughs> yeah, it's uh it's gonna be some interesting stuff to see how this all plays out. And again, great thing I love, great thing about this book, right at the right at the front is it tells you straight up this is all optional. There's no requirement to run any of this. Yeah. That's what's number cool. two. 10 rules to remember. The first one. The DM adjudicates the rules. Just because it's published doesn't mean the DM has to use it. <laughs> yeah. Like anything, you can adjust course as is. Same thing. Or, and this writing. one. Exceptions supersede. Again. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, this is some some interesting and i think this is good because there's these 10 general rules really kind of help because i've had many conversations about this on the table as a player as a dm but to actually see this in here in a clear way to where it's like acknowledging just because we have all this stuff out here doesn't mean you have to use everything and that again it's your game your world your choices as long as everyone is having fun at the table and continuing to play, we're good to go. But yeah, some uh, temporary hit points, the classic round down, because some people round up instead of rounding down. Well, I mean, this is kind of how the... In, there's a, the spirit of the game, I guess, is the best way to put it. <laughs> they are great. Concentration, it's right i guess these are a lot of things people would sit there and debate well here here you can end you can kind of end the debate because 10 to 1 this was con, 10 to 1 this was consulted with jeremy crawford and and jeremy crawford is like one of the guys if you want to talk rules check out ch- listen to some of the stuff jerry jeremy crawford talks about and some of some of the um intent behind those rules I found it very I've I have found it very enlightening over, over recent years. The f- the first two I think are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. The first rule, exceptions. Overruled. <laughs> so great. Yeah. When uh him and Todd get together when uh Jeremy Crawford and Todd Kendrick get on and talk, it's a great conversation. But uh, yeah, so that's Tasha's. If it's out right now on D&D Beyond, 
Uh, if you want to, you can pick up your digital copy there. Um, you could probably also pick up your print copies through all the major places. I personally would encourage you to support your local game shop and pick it up through them. Granted, it's in, in some cases you may pay a little bit more, but that's only because they don't have the volume of copies that yeah. places like Amazon has where they have pallets of it in a warehouse they can ship out. But if we don't support our local game shops, then they're going to go away. And sometimes those are great venues to start playing, start collecting, start interacting. Um, I know my local game shop that I visit often is Tower of Games here in, in Virginia Beach, Virginia. They are a great shop that I've spent a lot more time at recently. Uh, picking up paints, model uh, models, to, and they do. They had a lot of uh, regular gameplays. So support your local shop. There's that public service announcement on that. <laughs> yeah. Support local always. Well, support the local shops and they keep they keep things going and something sometimes that's the only place you'll find certain things yeah like i found i saw uh tonight one of the manicore paint night kits finally i didn't pick it up but you know i did pick up some more valet i did pick up some more paints so i could start working as some of the uh, on this whole bucket of minis back there <laughs> yeah i've got a i i Kind of it's there. I've got a bucket of minis to start going through, and I'm probably gonna paint. Thinking maybe paint one a day on Sundays. So we'll see how that goes. Figure to be nice giggles. Alrighty. So we covered all that. Uh, what else have we got? Some odds and ends. Odds and ends. Yeah. Odds and ends. Yes. Okay, let's do some odds and ends. Boom, shakalaka. Yeah. Now, I think we're going to do odds and ends a little differently today. A little bit. A little differently today. <laughs> uh, normally, when we do odds and ends, which is a collection of internet stories that Rye finds and sends me, and I just have to go, oh, gosh, what did he send me now? Yeah. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, you probably do it anyway. So it's okay. Touche. <laughs> so normally I try to pull screen grabs and throw them up and whatnot. Well, you know what? How about we change it up? Let's actually look at the articles live no. on the interwebs. It's not an end with the odds. It's just um, we're just changing up how we're presenting the articles. <laughs> ends with the odds, the odds and the ends. Yes. Good pun. I see. I'm slow tonight. Drop your coin in the jar on, uh, uh, for, on the pun jar. But, I will. Uh, uh, you know, toss one to your, your witcher, I guess. Yes, you know. toss it to your witcher. <laughs> uh, first article we're going to talk about is we'll spend nearly a decade of our lives staring at our phones, according to a, a study. This is off of a CNET's website. Oh, yeah. It um, leads to another <laughs> article about, about it. So, yeah, it's... um. Talk to me about the article, Ry. Talk okay. to me about the study, because you looked okay. at the study. I'm looking at the article. Okay, yeah. So in the qu article from CNET, it links, it links, not links, links to the study about how we will spend nine years of your life, our lives, on staring at the phones. Um, so the average person will spend almost nine years of their life on the phone, um, which works out between 8.74 years of your life. And they say this is based, quote, on the average age of acquiring a phone, which is now just over 10 years old, coupled with 3.07 hours of average daily use. I'll stop Three there. hours of daily use yeah. on average? Yeah, I'll stop there so you can soak that in. There's still more stats to drop. <laughs> what do you think about that? About three, hour, three hours a day on, your, on, on this device right here. I think the numbers are skewed right off the tap, because right off the bat, because they're talking about the average age someone gets a device is 10 yeah is now just over 10 years old which makes sense because i have seen kids younger than 10 getting smartphones and tablets yeah that's, and the, that's the thing it, i don't think it takes into account i mean yeah. an ipad i mean how many how many of a are, are kindles i mean they make kindles for kids and yeah. all of that how many of those have we've 
have, have been coming out and the fact that like Kindle, for example, has the kids free time, which is a kind of a, a what's the word I'm looking for? A uh, managed uh, space of yeah. apps and books and things like that for younger audiences to be able to look at. And how many games are geared toward that whole preschool early early ad? There's a lot, a lot of games built for you know preschool. So, so yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's just the one stat, and then it goes uh, diving uh, diving deeper into it. Was it which generation spends the most time on their phone? Which we kind of might guess, uh, but they break down in a chart, and the chart goes from boomers about two point five hours, Generation X is about three hours, and millennials is three point seven hours. Makes sense. Uh, quote, uh, just to put an asterisk on here, it does not include the next generation after uh, millennials, which is Generation Z. So, which yeah, is the ones that grew ingrained with this stuff. So that is Generation Z is the one that are actually having withdrawal systems yes. when they're told they can't have their devices. Yeah. I mean, no kidding. My kids' grades right now suck. Yeah. Right? I saw their latest report cards. I was not happy as a parent. Not happy at all. So what did I do? I... Now, I gave them the opportunity to keep track of their grades, keep track of their studies, keep on it. Because if you take personal responsibility, you deal with it. Yep. Their grades weren't doing so hot. Mm -mm. And I finally got sick of it. So I was like, all right, give me the devices. So I took the devices away. In my son's case amazing how this works <laughs> you've told me this before i told you but i'm gonna tell the internet because right, i want the internet to enjoy my humor at this it is humorous from an adult perspective since april right when this whole thing went down i i, I told my kids look i want you up by 8 15 8 30 doing your chores do that stuff and then you can sit on your devices my son would roll out of bed maybe eight maybe ten 10, 11, school gets into session. He was finally doing good. Then there was times he was sitting there not showing up for class, logging in on time before class. And then he would be up until like two in the morning. He would do this for, do this for weeks, right? Grades went, mm. so I took the devices. No kidding. The next day he was up by 730 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Take away the the Gen Z are the ones that go through withdrawal because apparently they can't exist without having a phone or a tablet in their hands. Now I'm sure there are exceptions. There's always exceptions to it, <laughs> but we you gotta yeah, like you said, you gotta look at it through the lens that when Generation Z came up, the devices were here. Yeah, but or it's like other generations, boomers and Gen Xers. You know, I'm part of the based on the time frame, I'm part of the millennials. Yes, you based are based on the time frame. The I, this I, end, this far end, people. Oh but, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're at that point where it's like you can look, you look over the fence and see all us Gen Xers going, ha ha, and yeah, be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or in other part of the hand, but yeah, I'm a Gen X. Yeah. Obviously, I'm I'm a Gen X. Yeah. I mean, cell phones were those big bricks in cars when I was in high school. Gotta love the mateys videos. Yeah, I love seeing those in those 80 movies. That's not April. Oh. Hey, I just don't know anymore. I'm staring at my device I mean, too much. I had to, I like had to, I, I, I was part of that crew that was like, when we got a pager, we thought we were really independent. That was the, that was the thing. And so, was... I mean, I didn't see a cell phone until, you know, post mil till military life i believe i got my cell phone in high school see so <laughs> but yeah there's some more interesting stats to drop the final one that plays into the the millennial generation x boomer things it says uh when you factor in the average sleep time which is around nine and hours quote millennials spend nearly a quarter of their waking lives 23.1 percent on their smartphone Gen X falls down to 16.5 and boomers fall down to 9.9%. I can believe it. I can believe it, especially because I don't get many calls on mine. Yeah. I, I, I would log in periodically to, you know, check a couple of like two games are uh, out of all the games. There's only two. I still actively mess with the rest of the time. It sits here 
I mean, I have to force myself to watch Instagram. Yep. I have to force myself to log into Facebook. The only one I kind of don't have much of a problem with is Twitter. But even then, I don't cycle through enough of it to stay truly informed. It's I pull it up, I swipe twice, and then I'm done, and I put the phone down. Yeah. The most time I spend looking at these things is when I'm like posting notifications and trying to put content out because I'm looking at these less of a personal consumption and more of a business uh, distribution as like I have I'm trying to get to the point where I'm making media to go out on these various platforms and content for these platforms to build up more of an interest in the stuff that I do. Yeah. <laughs> I can believe it. Like, I, I will literally just set it down and forget about it for most of the day. Yeah, and it's a, it's, it's a, I mean, it's an obvious thing that uh, most of us know, but putting it in stats and numbers makes it more relative to the changing of the times, changing of the generations, and the evolution of technology. Um, well, you know, there's a double there. There's the other side of that. And that's if you flip the script on that or because that's the thing about statistics. Every statistic I give you, you can give me the reverse and say something totally different. Yeah. But uh, I remember a couple of conversations with some parents who have got kids in this whole Gen Z thing where it's like long format content like traditional television or research on your own. No, if they literally cannot find it in a five minute YouTube, they don't bother. Yeah, it just it, it takes away the, the, the you see it more relevant. And this is just from me, because when I went college back the first time, you could see the differences in the generations and the difference that that these younger kids are having when it comes to being personal, the personal responsibility and actually doing things on their own and having to develop those more um, analytical and deep critical thinking skills. Um, you see it very obvious and see that, you know, this right here is a very important device in our lives today, but it shouldn't be the sole purpose of your life. So I think it's the stat, like you said, it can flip it one way or the other, you know, however you take it, but you know, you just got to find a balance. I got a balance. How about you spend some time building something cool or traveling like I do? Let's do both. Yes, let's do it. Let's talk about how Lego has just announced their large, the quote unquote largest uh, Lego set ever. Put the link in there for you peoples the largest they have released a lego reproduction of the coliseum the uh, roman coliseum and the thing is this thing comes in at nine thousand pieces which beats out the previous record holder for the most complicated Lego build. And that is the Millennium Falcon at just at about 7,500 pieces. Yeah, that's, that's a good, <laughs> that's a good, uh, a thousand plus pieces. Oh, it is. And the thing is, this is very interestingly engineered to uh, uh, showcase all of the architecture involved with the Coliseum. As we see it, if you were to go to Rome tomorrow. Oh, yeah, it's definitely um, it definitely it, uh, highlights uh, the scale and the, the depth that the Colosseum has. And it also adds into that creativity that somebody will spend the time to put in all those pieces together, not just putting the pieces together, building the specific Lego pieces to make it work. Are you kidding? I want this set. I do want this. And the best part is. I've, I mean, I love Star Wars Legos and everything, but I know Star Wars Legos uh, can 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 uh, really kind of hurt the pocketbook. Uh, yeah. The Coliseum, <laughs> like here's the box for it. I mean, but here's the thing. The Millennium Falcon, if you were to get that Lego set, you're dropping $800 yeah. US for the Millennium Falcon set. To purchase, to get this uh, Coliseum, you're dropping 550 Yeah. 
it's it's a, it's still a little pricey, but it's a heck of a lot cheaper than that seven ninety nine price tag. I mean, it might be worth it, but I mean, they do, trying to get. I mean, just looking at that, seeing the fact that they even got the subfloor area that was when it was all in its full construction was covered, and the gladiators would fight on top of that, and underneath would be the various cells and and rooms that they held everything underneath, and that's that's insane. But the level awesome. of detail just in a Lego set. I mean, it's it's crazy, you know. <laughs> but you know, Lego sets are one thing, but uh, well, the Lego the Lego is so utilitarian and so many different things. Like the architectural stuff, where you get these these representations of various models and architectural features are awesome. And then of course you have all the the literally, yeah, <laughs> liter my jaw literally dropped at the side of that price. Yeah. But think about the fact a Millennium Falcon will cost you almost twice that. Yeah, twice. So, you know, you're either dropping this or you're dropping that. And this is, I mean, but the architectural stuff, I mean, some of these custom sets and now that have the Lego builders where you could try to figure out and how to get it. I mean, Adam Savage on his channel has got like he's done the eye he's done the he did the sets for the space station he did the set for the razor crest he's done a lot of really cool sets and then people have actually gone through the lego creator software created something and then sent him the lego set which is all really cool how we can mess with the legos and it's actually the it's actually kind of funny because you can find all of these custom sets for all of these things but it, if, if you just want to get a utilitarian <laughs> bucket of pieces to be creative with, that is now harder to get. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the one thing about these Pringle, uh, not Pringle, uh, Lego sets um, is uh, I've been in the Lego store plenty of times. And, yeah, they can get pricey. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, Legos are not cheap. No. But the fact that we have the engineers coming up with cool things like this, worth it. Oh yeah, it is definitely definitely worth it. Um, but it's good, uh, it, you know, it's a creative thing, and I, I, it makes me look forward to other sets they can come up down the feet, down the road. Oh, they've they've got some wild ones. I have a friend who's a collector. He gets the uh, limited run uh, architect stuff, where it's like he's it's this. There's like the brownstones in New York or whatever, as in these various city block things that actually connect to make a little city to work through really cool stuff you had to build a custom table to set it up set it up on but those are also the ones where it's like you're buying that you're like dropping a thousand dollars on a set oh yeah you definitely those limited money. run collector edition lego sets you're definitely dropping a lot of money so and i remember i remember seeing a i think it was a it was a it was a showcase somewhere where somebody had made using legos had made one of the space shuttles with the launch platform and the fuel thing that you, when they used to when it used to roll on the tracks out of the hangar to the <laughs> launch thing, that whole track system and it, the thing was like five feet tall. I mean, that was a lot of pieces. Yeah, it takes a lot of pieces, but you know, creativity. Oh yeah, I mean, some really wild things people have come up with. But speaking of wild things that people have come up with, uh, I'm probably accidentally Freudian Freudian dropped it just a few minutes ago, but <laughs> uh, maybe. Yeah, but there you go. Let's go back to the land of the rising sun. Land of the rising sun. You know, they always seem to come up with stuff that just grabs our attention. Yeah, rising to the sun with some Pringles. Some Pringles. Pringles Japan has released a 161 centimeter long can of Pringles for Pringles Day. <laughs> Pringles Day, you can walk around Japan, Tokyo, Kyoto, wherever, with this giant long Pringles can. I mean, I could see that being a little hard to eat. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, it's interesting because in this little little article where they share all the photos and stuff, they said, "quote They also added that they would be offering eleven lucky fans a chance to receive a can based on their height too." yeah so not not only do you get this large large can you can get one as tall as you i'm pretty short but i'm still tall yep here's the promo for the to get the to get the can 
And of course we have this nice set of screenshots. I mean, that could be a little troublesome, but on the other, uh, on the other hand, you know, sharing with your friends in a COVID environment of social distancing just got a lot easier. Yeah. You know, it's long enough. It's probably six feet, you know, keep out of my face, keep out of my hands. <laughs> so breathe in another direction. People. I just had to throw that one out. We just, that one came across and it was just like, okay. I mean, I've had friends who've gone to Japan and whatever and come back and with these wild stories. And he, I mean, we, we have showcased all this year about various theme parks that they're doing and whatever. And then this, it's just yeah, like, it just makes me want to just pack up and go. I see why people want to move to Japan just for the, all the crazy cool things they come up with. Hmm. Uh, and- Crazy cool things. Let's talk about uh, all the science geeky fun. Let's geek out in space. Uh, we're going to close out our uh, odds and ends by talking about the latest SpaceX launch because, you know, we're all geeks. Yes. And let's talk about that. <laughs> so uh, SpaceX. Yep. SpaceX launched their first uh, man uh, space shuttle launch just a few days ago. Yep, li- they live streamed it. Um, launched up full crew up to the International Space Station for a six month uh, rotation uh, via the uh, Dragon capsule that SpaceX has been working on. Um, interesting thing about this is this was a long flight. Yeah. Um, based on the angle, based on where the ISS was and the window for launch, the crew. Uh, I think it said in here the crew had something like a 27 hour um voyage trip or 27 hour commute to get to the space station. And part of the reason why it was so long is is in talking in this article it says if they can't get there within 9 hours, they're going to extend it long enough for the crew to get some sleep so that they are wide awake when it comes to docking with the space station. Which I can't blame them. Yeah, you got to make sure you park it right, especially up in space. So, yeah. But apparently they uh they they were supposed to have docked with it yesterday, mm-hmm. uh, eleven p.m. Eastern time yesterday. So, imagine uh the news didn't say there was anything negative, so they probably are all docked and good to go and ready for their six month uh, rotation up there on the station, which uh, this is cool. And then they're going to use the same capsule to come back down. Uh, overall, the flight apparently went well. Yep, it went off without a hitch, which uh, is there a There was a thing. There was a minor uh, co- concern with the uh, environmentals, but that turned out to be, again, minor and yep. didn't affect the flight. Everybody seemed to be uh, doing, seemed to be uh, there, so. I'd say this is a nice, cool odd and end to show, you know, getting back into the whole space travel thing. Oh, yeah. It's definitely going into add in because they're going to do a lot of experiments up there, which will add to more and imp- amazing things down here on Earth, hopefully. Yeah. Well, let's start getting up there and seriously starting to colonize is my thought, because I I was hoping we'd be like, you know, already doing the moon trips on a uh, on a regular deal or and starting to talk about the Mars trips, not looking at, okay, I'll probably be in my 80s before we finally get to Mars again. Uh, well, hey, at least um, it'll get there someday, maybe. Uh, if not... Too much squabbling here on Terra. Yeah, I'll just put on <laughs> my virtual glasses and press buttons on the controller. <laughs> that way I can escape into something. Escape into something? Something. Cool beans. Well, we ran a little long, but you know, we had a lot we were talking and just kind of got a couple of rants, didn't we? Yeah. I'm always I always rant somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we didn't rant, we wouldn't be enjoyable, I hope. Ready player one? Yes. Let me put on my goggles and dance in the right outfit for you. Let's go hit up the oasis. Just put on some boogie nights. That's what I call a good night. <laughs> All righty. Marky Mark. Oh, gosh. All righty. Well, with that, uh, rolling back through our uh, uh, 
roll back through those things uh thank you to sirenscape for all the background musics and soundboards thank you to everyone in the community for spending your tuesday evening with us hanging out talking about geeky things and gaming things and all of that thank you to the moderators in the channel you guys are awesome and amazing and help keep things sane Yes, we are going to raid D&D Beyond for Silver and Steel because that is on right now and that is a really great show. And I'm just gonna roll over to that, but let me roll through my thing in my head real quick. Um, be sure to check us out uh, on Saturdays for Shadow Watch and Challenge Accepted, Sundays for Sunday with Scoob. Uh, if, if you're checking it out, checking us out on uh, YouTube, please be sure to give us a like and a and a subscribe and hit the little bell notification. And if you're one of those people listening to us in the audio audio format, please give us a thumbs up and a review because all of those things help us keep the lights on and keep everything going. And if you want to support the studio, come up here to Twitch tv slash scuba studio to check out all the great things uh you saw a little bit on the merch rotator we do have a holiday package in the merch store if you want to check that out to get your uh holiday sweater dealio going on you can do that and uh i've pretty much it looks like we're uh, let's queue up our queue up our raid and wish everybody a good night in a nice. safe week, and we will see you on our next stream. Stand by for the raid. Peace.